أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون ومن يفعل ذلك يلقى أثاما يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا إلا ما تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما وما تاب وعمل صالحا فإنه يتوب إلى الله متابا والذين لا يشهدون الزور وإذا مروا باللغو مروا كراما الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة المتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Inshallah, today uh, we'll be starting the discussion from ayah number 70. However, ayah number 70 begins by addressing or referring to, alluding to what was discussed previously, and that's why I started reciting from further back um, from ayah number 68. So very quickly to just kind of refresh our memories, ayah number 68, a translator writes for the ayah, those who never invoke any other deity besides God, nor take a life which God has made sacred, except in the pursuit of justice, nor commit adultery, whoever does these things will face the penalties. Then in ayah number 69, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُضَعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَيَخْلُدُ فِيهِ مُهَانَ Translator writes, their torment will be doubled on the day of resurrection, and they will remain in torment disgraced. Now starting from ayah number 70, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا A translator writes for this, except those who repent, believe, and do good deeds. God will change the evil deeds of such people into good ones. He is most forgiving, most merciful. So the ayah begins with the word illa. Illa, of course, makes an exception from what was said previously. So in the previous ayat, we learned about how we talked about the, the, some of the greatest of the sins that a person can engage in, associating partners with Allah, taking uh, a life, and thirdly was committing adultery. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised punishment for them, that they will face penalties, and then in the hereafter, that, uh, that their punishment will be multiplied and they will remain disgraced and humiliated therein for all of eternity. So here Allah says, illa, except. And this is very powerful in the sense that what basically it's saying is that even now, even after somebody has fallen into such a reprehensible behavior, such major sins, even then hope is not lost. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, illa, except man taba, Whosoever repented, whosoever repented. We talked previously about the meaning of tawbah, repentance, that it actually refers to turning things around, changing one's course in life, basically turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except for the one who repented. So that person realized, and repentance is, we, we had discussed this somewhat previously, but just to overall um, talk about the mindset that when somebody's going in the wrong direction, they first have to realize that they are headed in the wrong direction. Secondly, they have to then have the motivation, have the inclination to actually change their direction. And so it's talking about illa man taba, somebody who realizes what they're doing is wrong, and they have the motivation to turn that around, to change that. Wa amana, and then that person believed. So this is specifically addressing because it talked about la yad'una ma'allah ilahan akhar, associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they believed. So they correct that iman, that faith, that belief. Wa amila amalan saliha. And then they do good deeds. Right? They, they, they began to actually implement change within their lives by 
acting on that change by implementing good deeds. Now, here, there's a very, you know, kind of fascinating dynamic. Um, normally within the Qur'an, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, you know, somebody doing good deeds, it's mentioned usually as, you know, we often see, وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ That they do good. So, the, the deed themselves are not mentioned, but it, it says that they do good. And obviously what's implied by that is that they're doing good deeds. So, but here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says, وَعَمِلَا عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَعَمِلَا عَمَلًا صَالِحًا So, what exactly is the, um, you know, benefit of stating it, stating the action more explicitly? Normally in the Qur'an, it's وَعَمِلَا صَالِحًا They do good. But here Allah is saying they do good deeds, right? They do good actions. There's almost like a level of repetition that is present here. And... <clears throat> So what's exactly precisely the benefit of that? And we do find this a couple of other places in the Qur'an, even though by and far the norm in the Qur'an is to not reiterate the action. It's وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا But Allah says, مَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِي فَلْيَعْمَلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا So the deed is emphasized. And the benefit and the purpose of emphasizing the deed, many of the scholars have mentioned, is to emphasize that any type, any level, any amount of deed, it's to emphasize the fact that rather than obsessing over some grandiose like notion of good or um, obsessing over you know, some really remarkable achievement, that the road to redemption, the road to redemption begins with just embracing the opportunity to engage the opportunity to be able to carry out any level, any type of a good deed. That sometimes we can, you know, just to use more common plain language, we can almost psych ourselves out. That, and, and, and this is very much, just this is very natural for a human being to feel this way. And I'll give you a little example that kind of goes back to the era of the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Wahshi, who is known as the individual who assassinated the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Wahshi had killed the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. He accepted Islam, he repented, and basically did what was required of him. He believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he repented, and, and that's enough to wipe away that deed, that action that he had done. But what we find later on in his life is that Musaylama al-Kadhab, the false prophet, who was a very problematic individual, he was a false prophet, he was tearing apart the community of the believers, he was oppressing people and killing people, and he was a terrible individual, that when there was finally, when the forces of Musay against the forces of the Muslims, in that particular battle, Wahshi says, that I was, ba I spent that time, I, I, in that battle, I was fixated on one singular cause. And that one singular cause was, I had to find Musaylama and kill him. Because I felt this burden, I felt this obligation, that I had killed one of the best of people, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that in order to, you know, make up for that, the penance for that was to kill the worst of people, this man Musaylama. And only after I had, you know, taken out Musaylama did I feel like a burden was lifted off me. Even though, obviously, by accepting Islam, by believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believing in the Prophet, ﷺ, living a life of righteousness, he had more he, he had done anything and everything that was required of him. But it's just very natural for a human being to kind of feel that burden. So somebody who maybe has made some major mistakes within their life, they might feel that they, they realize that they're headed down the wrong path in life. And they believe. And then they're making an effort to turn their life around. They kind of feel this weight and this burden of doing something very grand or doing something tremendous. That that's the only way I, that I can make up for what I've done. That's the only, that's the only um, you know, salvation for my soul. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us otherwise in the Qur'an. And this is consolation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعَمِلَا عَمَلًا صَالِحًا 
even a singular good deed, right? As you know, the expression goes about the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And so it's just taking that one step in the right direction. When people come and talk, right, the, the, the man who came to the Prophet ﷺ and confessed of the fact that, you know, he had committed a major sin. And he felt so weighed down and so burdened by this. And the Prophet ﷺ, it was time for the prayer. The Prophet ﷺ took him to make, go make wudu and then they came back and they prayed together. And afterwards he tells the Prophet ﷺ that I have committed a grave sin. And I need, to I need to pay penance, I need to find salvation. I need redemption, I need to redeem myself. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Did you not just do wudu? Didn't you just pray with us? And he says, yes. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Then go, God has forgiven you. People come in there, maybe they'll say, you know, I haven't prayed for 10 years. Now what do I do? Well, what you do is that in, in an hour when it's time for salah, you just stand up and you pray. That's, what, that's, that's all you can do. Right? The man who came to the Prophet ﷺ at the Battle of Khaybar and said, you know, I lived my entire life dis in disbelief of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, committing sins. And he accepted Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ said, okay. And he said, I want to help. And the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, you just kind of stand here and keep watch. And then he comes and he says, no, no, I need to do something more. And the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, fine. He had that zeal. He said, fine, you can, can I go into the battlefield? Yeah, I'm sure you can go. And he went into the battlefield and he lost his life there in the battlefield. And the Prophet ﷺ said that this man has entered paradise and he didn't even perform one sajda. Ma sajda lillahi sajdatan. Wa dakhal al jannah. He never did a single sajda, but yet he entered paradise. Right? So we have to understand that Yes, to a certain degree and to a certain extent, that, 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 that feeling, that sentiment of remorse and regret, and that, that compulsion, that, that desire to want to do good and make up, is, is, is a good thing to a certain degree, to a certain extent. It can drive us, it can motivate us, it can push us. But it can also demoralize and it can also paralyze someone and, and really weigh a person down. And that's what we just have to understand who exactly it is that we are dealing with. The Rabb that we are interacting with, that we, are, that we have a relationship with. That Wallahu alimu bi sudur, He knows what's within our hearts and our chests. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how sincerely we want to make up for the wrong that we've done. He knows how regretful and remorseful we are. He, he knows how sincere and, and how real our zeal is. And we just have to make sure that we don't, you know, um, in, we, we don't become an obstacle for ourselves. And that we don't demoralize ourselves. But we take every single opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides to be able to keep building something good. Start building something good. And that's one brick at a time. And so, وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَلِحًا So whosoever repented, believed, and then did good, even if it was one good deed, but got started. فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those people, Allah will exchange their sins for good deeds. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been, is and will always be constantly forgiving, all forgiving and constantly all merciful. Now, <clears throat> after having addressed, you know, the, the, the dynamic, the very powerful dynamic of just this one word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, inserts into the ayah here, amalan. The second part of it talks about now the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to them. That Allah will exchange, convert, replace their sins, their misdeeds with good. What does that exactly mean and how is that precisely interpreted? So the scholars 
mention two different ways to understand this. And both of these understandings are founded within, they are both legitimate from the linguistic perspective, and they are also supported by different either narrations, a hadith, or opinions of the Sahaba and the Salaf. The first interpretation of this is أَنَّهُمْ بَدَّلُوا مَكَانَ عَمَلِ السَّيِّئَاتِ بِعَمَلِ الْحَسَنَاتِ That basically what Allah, when it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace their sins with good, what that means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace their bad actions with the ability to now do good actions. So what, that, what it's basically saying is that when a person was maybe living life in a particular way and their book of deeds was full of you know, sins, and they believed, they believe, they repented, then all of their sins were wiped out. All of their sins were cleaned out, wiped out. The register was just wiped clean, erased. Then where those sins were previously written, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the ability to start doing good. And so now good deeds are being written down where previously sins were written. Where previously sins were written. So that's what it means by Allah is now replacing the sins with good. On the page that previously had sins written on it, good deeds are now being written on it as that person continues down the path of good. So that's the first way that it's interpreted. This is how Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhum I interpreted as well. هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلِ إِيمَانِهِمْ عَلَى سَيِّئَاتِ فَرَغَبَ اللَّهُ بِهِمْ عَنْ ذَلِكَ فَحَوَّلَهُمْ إِلَى الْحَسَنَاتِ فَأَبْدَلَهُمْ مَكَانَ سَيِّئَاتِ الْحَسَنَاتِ and similarly, uh, Atab bin Abi Rabah, one of the Mufassirun from the generation of the Tabi'un, he says, Yakunu Raju Hada fi dunya. He says, This is the life of this world. Yakunu Rajulu ala hayatin qabiha, thumma yubadiluhu lahu biha khaira. That a person was living their life in a very evil manner before, in a most distasteful fashion. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces that, meaning Allah gives a person the ability to live life in a more dignified manner, in a dignified fashion. So that's what it refers to when it's talking about replacing it. The second interpretation of this, however, the second interpretation of this is that أَنَّ تِلْكَ سَيِّئَاتِ الْمَاضِيَا تَنْقَلِبُ بِنَفْسِ تَوْبَةٍ نَسُوحْ حَسَنَاتٍ That the sins that were already recorded and written in the register, those sins, so if there were a hundred pages of sin, Right? So to understand, to get a visual, if there were a hundred pages worth of sins that were written, those hundred pages, the first interpretation was, hundred pages are wiped clean, and then starting from page one, good deeds are being written previously where sins were written. The second interpretation is that if a hundred pages worth of sins were written, those hundred pages of sins are converted into good deeds. So from here on out, any good deeds that a person does starts from page 101. The person starts off with a hundred pages worth of good deeds, already recorded in the register of the person. Now, that seems like, you know, some people might be somewhat curious, like again, we don't doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ability uh, to do so. Allah is ghafoor, Allah is rahim, qadir ala kulli shay. But somebody might be a little curious about that. That almost seems like you're giving somebody credit for something they did not do, right? And, so how exactly does that work? So there's two things, uh, a couple of things I'll share with you about that. First of all, there are narrations from the Prophet ﷺ which support this particular interpretation. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet uh, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنِّي لَأَعْرِفُ آخِرَ أَهْلِ النَّارِ خُرُوجًا مِنَ النَّارِ وَآخِرَ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ دُخُولًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ that the Prophet ﷺ said, I certainly, I indeed know or recognize the last of the people of the fire of hell to exit from the hellfire, and the last of the people of paradise to enter paradise. So this is the last person to leave hell, and therefore the last person who will be entering paradise. And then he goes on to say, يُؤْتَى بِرَجُلٍ فَيَقُولُ that this man will be brought, this individual will be brought forth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command that Nahu kibara dhunubihi wa saluhu an sigariha. That basically account, right, 
you know, account for uh, all the major sins of this person and then question this person even about his minor sins. Right? That basically put aside, like all of his major sins are recorded, so put those aside and ask him even, ask him about the minor sins that he committed. قَالَ فَيُقَالُ لَهُ عَمِلْتَ يَوْمَ كَذَا وَكَذَا كَذَا That person will then be asked that on such and such day you did such and such action. وَعَمِلْتَ يَوْمَ كَذَا كَذَا وَكَذَا and on such and such day, you did such and such. Right? That the person will start to. So they, they take the major sins, they say, leave the major sins for now, put them aside. Let's start with the minor sins. And that person will start to be questioned that on such and such day, you did this, and on such and such day, you did that. فَيَقُولُ نَعَمْ And that person will say yes. Agreed. Accepted. لَا يَسْتَطِيعَ أَنْ يُنْكِرَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ شَيْئًا That person will not have the ability, that person will not feel that the person has the ability to be able to deny any of that. He'll just readily accept all of it. فَيُقَالُ لَهُ فَيُقَالُ At that time it will be announced, it will be proclaimed, فَإِنَّ لَكَ بِكُلِّ سَيِّئَةٍ حَسَنَةٍ That for every sin you had committed and owned up and fessed up to, you will be given a good deed. So that person will then say, يَقُولُ يَا رَبِّي عَمِلْتُ أَشْيَا لَا أَرَاهَا هُنَا he said, wait, 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 there's lots of other things that I did as well. <laughs> right? There's lots of things I don't see here. I did this and I did that. And he'll just start spilling the beans. And very beautifully, Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, فَضَحِكَ رَسُولَهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ سَلَامَ حَتَّى بَذَدْنَ وَاجِذُهُ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم laughed so hard that we could see like his teeth. And so this narration supports this particular idea that it will be replaced. The second thing to also, that, that um, some of the Mufassirun, Imam Al-Qurtubi rahimahullahu ta'ala mentions this, that, or, or I believe Imam Al-Razi also mentions this, that another way to understand this and to kind of make sense of it, if somebody does, first of all, it's not really a problem for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Right? We don't limit the mercy of Allah. But just in case somebody kind of has this curiosity, how is somebody getting credit for something they did not do? Right? That's what they mention is that when a person truly believes and repents, and if the person's repentance is true, what they naturally do in that scenario is, they are more aware of their sins than anyone else. And they very much feel the burden, the weight of their sins. They're very conscious of their sins. And they feel very remorse, remorseful and regretful. And as they regret each and every single sin, and as they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them for those previous sins, that that act of tawbah in and of itself is the good deed. Because see, repentance, tawbah in and of itself is a good deed. Turning back to Allah is a good deed. Owning up to your mistakes is a good deed. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help is a good deed. So as they're counting throughout their now life all the bad things that they've done, they themselves are engaging in good deed. So it's not that they're just getting credit for something they did not do, because they are regretful and remorseful for those sins that they might have com that they committed previously. And then also, um, this is an interpretation that's been mentioned by many of the other, you know, Sahaba and the scholars as well. Salman al-Farsi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, يُعْطَى رجل, uh, يُعْطَى رَجُلٌ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ صَحِفَتَهُ فَيَقْرَأُ أَعْلَاهَا um, a person will be given their book of deeds on the day of resurrection. That person will read like kind of like the top of it, like the, the, the first few pages of it, think of it that way. فَإِذَا سَيِّئَتْهُ And those will be his sins. فَإِذَا كَادَ يَسُؤُ ظَنُّهُ And then as that person starts to kind of sink into the state of hasra, remorse and regret, and starts to kind of, the feeling starts to wash over the person that I'm doomed. The second the person starts to feel that they're doomed, that person will flip the page, turn the page and look further in the book of deeds. Then he'll see good deeds. And he'll get excited. Then he'll flip the page back and look back at the first page. And then he'll see that those sins that were written there on the first page previously have not been converted to good deeds as well. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward the person. Abu Daif 
who is a tabi'i, he was from the students of Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says, يَدُخُلُ أَهْلُ الْجَنَّةِ الْجَنَّةَ عَلَىٰ أَرْبَعَةِ أَصْنَافِ There are four types, four categories of people that will enter paradise. المتقين, ثم الشاكرين, ثم الخائفين, ثم أصحاب اليمين. He says that they are the God conscious, those who live the life of gratitude, those who are mindful and fearful of God, and fourthly, the people of the right hand. I mean the people of good deeds. So, Abu Daif says that I asked my teacher when he was saying this, Mu'ad bin Jabal was telling us this, I asked him, Lima sumu ashab al yameen? Why, why is this last category being called ashab al yameen? People of the right or the people of good deeds. Qala li yannakum amilu al hasanat wa sayyiat. They are the group of people that did good and bad. They were given their book of deeds in their right hand. And they stood there and they read their sins word for word, one after another after another. And they said, Oh, our Lord and Master, these are our sins. We confess to our sins. We confess to our sins. Where are our good deeds, Ya Allah? Where are our good deeds? Like asking Allah for mercy. فَعِنْدَ ذَلِكَ مَحَ اللَّهُ السَّيِّئَاتِ وَجَعَلَهَا حَسَنَاتِ At that point in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove the sins and replace them with good deeds. فَعِنْدَ ذَلِكَ قَالُوا هَا أُمُقْرَأُوا كِتَابِيَا And at that point, they will proclaim what is mentioned in Surah Al-Haqqa. They'll hold up the book and they say, هَا أُمْ هَا أُمْ Hey everybody, look, look. اِقْرَأُوا كِتَابِيَا Look at my book, look at my book, read my book. فَهُمْ أَكْثَرُوا أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ And he says, the, this, type of, this category of people will be the majority of the people in paradise. Right? That paradise isn't a place. Like uh, the people that are destined to paradise aren't people, the perfect people. But they are humble people. It's not that they're perfect people, they're humble people. That humility is what's very, very important. Another narration mentions, جَاءَ شَيْخٌ كَبِيرٌ هَرِمٌ قَدْ سَقِيطَ حَاجِبَهُ عَلَىٰ عَيْنَيْهِ A very old man came to the Prophet ﷺ to the point where his eyebrows were kind of hanging over his eyes. فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ And he said, O Messenger of God, uh, O Messenger of Allah ﷺ, he said, رَجُلٌ غَدِرٌ وَفَجِرٌ Basically he's referring to himself, he's saying, I'm a terrible, sinful man. I'm a wretched, sinful old man. وَلَمْ يَدَعْ حَاجَةً وَلَا دَاجَةً إِلَّا إِلَّا إِقْتَطَعَهَا بِيَمِينِهِ لَوْ قُسِمَتْ خَطِئَتُهُ بَيْنَ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ لَأَوْبَقَتْهُمْ فَهَلْ لَهُمْ مِنْ تَوْبَعَ That such a wretched old man that he did not spare. Once again, he's kind of talking about himself like in the third person. Saying that such a terrible, wretched old man that he had not, you know, come across any opportunity to do wrong except that he had seized it. Like he had left, he left no stone unturned in the pursuit of sin and evil. And his sins are so numerous that if they were spread over all the inhabitants of the earth, it would doom, it would doom everyone. It would ruin everyone. So much sin. فَهَلَّهُ مِنْ تَوْبَةً Can such a man be forgiven? فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَسْلَمْتَ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, Have you accepted Islam? He said, قَالَ أَمَّا أَنَا فَأَشْهَدُ أَلَّا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَاسُلُهُ He says, as for me, what I can tell you about myself, I bear witness, I give testimony that there's no one worthy of worship except for Allah. Allah alone, and there, He has no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the slave of God and the messenger of Allah. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِنٌ لَكَ مَا كُنْتَ كَذَلِكَ As long as you remain in this condition, this state of submission to Allah, God has forgiven you. وَمُبَدِّلُوا سَيِّئَاتِكَ حَسَنَاتِ and God has converted all your sins to good deeds. فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ And just, the man says, O Messenger of God, وَغَدَرَاتِ وَفَجَرَاتِ Even like my very terrible sins and mistakes, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَغَدَرَاتَكَ وَفَجَرَاتَكَ 
وَقَدَرَاتِكَ وَفَجَرَاتِكَ He says, even your terrible sins and mistakes. فَوَلَا الرَّجُلُ يُهَلِّلُ وَيُكَبِّرُ The man turned around, walked away, loudly saying, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ Kept saying this in the narration, says, فَمَا زَالَ يُكَبِّرْ حَتَّى تَوَارَى We kept on hearing him say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, until he was so far away that we couldn't see him anymore. Even after we couldn't see him, we could still hear his voice until we finally couldn't hear him anymore. That this is the hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives. So coming back to the ayah, the last thing that I was going to mention, something <clears throat> that I felt is very intriguing. The first interpretation was that Allah will wipe away their sins and give them the ability to do good and then that good will be written in place of the sins. That's how Allah means exchange their sins for good, for good deeds. But the second interpretation, Allah will just convert those sins to good deeds. If you look at the ayah, the ayah is very interesting. It says, فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ Their sins. حَسَنَاتٍ it didn't say hasanati him. Not their good deeds. The second interpretation. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is automatically converting their sins to good deeds. It's not that then Allah is then giving them the ability to do good. That's what's being written there. But it's saying Allah converted their sins into good deeds. Not that Allah replaced their sins with their good deeds. Ulaika yubaddilu Allahu sayyatihim bi hasanati him. That's not what Allah said. Allah said that, فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ Just with good deeds. Alright, so that lends also credence to the second interpretation that we talked about. Something very interesting, and like I mentioned before, that we had already talked about, exhaustively spoken about the subject of Tawbah, but something else very interesting, Shaykh al-Sha'rawi rahimahullah ta'ala, he says something very profound about Tawbah. In Surah At-Tawbah, ayah number 118, Allah says, ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُوا Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned to them, meaning Allah gave them the ability to repent so that they can repent. And in the next ayah, we're also going to see kind of the repetition of the Tawbah. وَمَنْ تَابَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ Mataba, فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ He says because وَلِتَوْبَةِ amran. He says there's two blessings in Tawbah. Number one is the fact that God has instituted, God created, God provided the institution of Tawbah. That's the first blessing. Do you understand what that means? What that means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a system for us. Gave us just the opportunity, provided the opportunity that I have made a mistake, that there is still a hope for that mistake to be wiped out. Where else does that opportunity exist? Where, 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 what, where else do we see that opportunity where I can make a mistake and just simply say, I'm sorry, and it's just completely wiped out? Oh, you're sorry? Okay, that's fine then. Where does that exist? Human beings are not capable, are rarely capable of that. But the fact that Allah has created, provided the opportunity of tawbah, instituted tawbah, is in and of itself a, a, a tremendous blessing, enough of a blessing. Then, when Allah gives us the ability to repent, when Allah gives us the tawfiq, guides us to actually repent, that's a second blessing. So that's something very profound that he mentions about this. In the next ayah, ayah number 71, وَمَنْ تَابَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَابًا A translator writes, people who repent and do good deeds truly return to God. And whosoever repents and does good, he certainly has re repented towards Allah with a true repentance. Another translator writes, and this again also is a theme that we've talked about and we somewhat spoke about this, but I'd like to highlight something here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nisa says, وَمَن يَعْمَلْ سُؤَنْ أَوْ يَضِلْ نَفْسَهُ ثُمَّ يَسَّقْفِ لِلَّهَ يَجِدِ اللَّهَ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا That whosoever did wrong or wronged themselves by committing sins and then asks Allah for forgiveness will find God to be most forgiving and most merciful. 
All right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, huwa huwa alladhi yaqbalu tawbata an ibadihi wa ya'fu an sayyi'ati wa ya'lamu ma tafa'lu. Wa huwa alladhi, he Allah is the one who constantly, continuously accepts the repentance from his slaves. Allows them to turn back to him. يَقْبَلُ تَوْبَةَ عَنْ عِبَادِهِ وَيَعْفُوا عَنِ السَّيِّئَاتِ And then he wipes away the sins that they previously had committed because of turning back to him. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ And what's very profound is this wow, this wow that's mentioned here, is called wow haliya, while he knows وَيَعْلَمُ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ He knows what you're going to do next. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow. That you're human, and you're probably going to slip up and make that mistake again. Or make a different mistake. But He allows you to turn things around, come back to Him, wipes out the mistake, even though He knows that you're going to make a mistake again. That that's who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Now, there are two questions here to, that the Mufassirun ask, that they pose. The first one, if you look at just this ayah, ayah number 71, وَمَنْ تَابَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا Whosoever repented and did good, فَإِنَّهُ Then that person, يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَابَ That person truly repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, truly turns back to God. Okay? The يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَابَ Mataban is what we call maf'ul mutlaq. Remember when we had studied about different types of details, some of them are, you know, how, what was the nature of it, or how badly. We had talked about like how badly. Darabtuhu darban. I didn't just hit him, but I beat him up. Alright, so same here. Yatubu ilallahi mataba is for that. And that person truly repents to Allah. So someone who, tr- who repented to Allah, truly repents to Allah. Is anyone seeing kind of the potential for a question here? Because... The Mufassirun stayed here, right? Imam Al Qurtubi writes, لا يقال من قام فإنه فإنه يقوم. He says it's not normal in Arabic to say whoever stood then he stands. Like it's almost like talking in circles. It sounds like. So what's exactly being said here? Like why why is this kind of repeating? How, what what's being said here? Of course, something profound and remarkable is being said because Allah said it. But what is being said? Right? That who repented, then he truly repents. So the scholars mention that there are a few different ways to understand this and to answer this question. Number one, notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Man taba wa amila salihan. Whoever repented and then did, did, then did good, that, per, that person truly repents to Allah. That person has truly, that person is truly turning back to Allah. Whoever was remorseful, regretful for what they did, and then did something good to prove to themselves and to Allah that they are really turning things around, that person is the one who is truly turning back to Allah. That this is basically emphasizing the fact that we have to at some point move past lip service. We have to stop talking about turning things around and we actually have to turn things around. That it's emphasizing the action. That's what it means. That somebody who not only just said, okay, I messed up, but then tried to do something good, really took a step, a a step in the right direction, that is somebody who is truly turning things around. Okay, that's what, that's how to reconcile the apparent repetition of the ayah. The second thing, the second explanation that's given for this, that was remarkable, Imam al-Razi mentions this. If you look at the ayah, and particularly for the, for the per, you know, aimed at the Qur'an intensive students here, I want you to look at the ayah very carefully. Man taba. Taba is a fi'al. Is it past tense or present tense? Past tense. وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ يَتُوبُ Is that past or present tense? Present Present slash future tense. Okay? That's madi and mudari. So he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, whoever in the madi, in the past tense, whoever repented to God and did good, 
then he will continue to turn back to Allah repeatedly. The more times you make tawbah, the more you get used to turning back to Allah, the more you become comfortable and embrace asking Allah for forgiveness, owning up to your mistakes, seeking the mercy and the forgiveness of Allah, the more you become comfortable with it, you become confident in it, the more you start, the more you believe in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the more you turn back to Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what does he say? وَإِنِّي لَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ أَكْثَرْ مِنْ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةً That I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness more than 70 times a day. More than 70 times a day. Right? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the believers, وَبِالْ أَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ They wake up every night and ask Allah for forgiveness. The most pious and the righteous are the ones who ask Allah for forgiveness more than anyone else, more than the sinful do. That's the effect of that relationship with Allah, that humility. That's true spirituality. Where you are more cognizant of your mistakes and errors, than anyone else's. And so that's what it's emphasizing. Whoever turned back to Allah will undoubtedly continue to find the ability to keep turning back to Allah. And that's what's really remarkable and profound that Allah mentions in this particular ayah. Now, the second question that's posed by the Mufassirun here, ayah 70, the previous ayah that we just discussed, and ayah 71, this one right here. The previous ayah, ayah 70, and this one, ayah 71. The previous ayah said, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ It talked about repenting to Allah, turning back to Allah, repentance, tawbah. This ayah talks about repentance, tawbah, turning back to Allah. Turning back to Allah, turning back to Allah. There seems to be some repetition here. Like why is Allah talking about the same thing again? Right, like what's, what, what are we supposed to learn here? What's the benefit here? We have to ask ourselves that. This is there for us to ponder on, reflect upon, think about. And one of the um, a two, two explanations that are given for this, the first one from Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, is that he says that the first one is talking about major sins, the second one is talking about minor sins. Because the first one said, illa. Connecting back to the previous verse that talked about three major sins. It talked about shirk, it talked about qatl, it talked about zina. It talked about associating partners with God, it talked about murder, it talked about adultery. Major sins. And that's why there was more emphasis in that ayah, وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا That you gotta, you gotta get started down the road to recovery. Yes, you had fallen into, you had some major issues. But you can work through them. You just got to start taking the steps in the right direction. This ayah is now about the minor sins. Alright? Another explanation that's given that Imam Al-Qurtubi rahmallahu ta'ala also quotes is from Al-Qafal, one of the scholars. He writes that the previous ayah is talking about a non-Muslim entering into Islam. That's why it said, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَا Who believed. Except the one who repented and he believed, Iman. It's talking about a non-Muslim entering into Islam. Someone's coming from kufr to Iman. And this is talking about for the believer, for the one who already has their Iman, somebody who is a Muslim, somebody who is a believer, that again, they're not going to be perfect, they're going to make mistakes, they just have to remember to keep turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright, so that's to answer the question of why does it seem like it's talking about the same theme again. It's not just simply emphasis, that's not good enough of an explanation. There's other ways to emphasize things than to repeat yourself all over again. But rather, the two dynamics, Ibn Abbas says, first one is about major sins, second one is about minor sins. Qafal says the first one is about somebody entering into Iman and then finding their way. And the second one is about somebody who is has Iman but is stumbling along the way. The first one is about finding your way, the second one is when you stumble on your way. Alright? Ayah number 72. 
والذين لا يشهدون زورا واذا مروا باللغو مروا كراما now this kind of returns back to the format that we were following previously before this the interjection that was mentioned there with sins and repentance all right which can also be counted amongst the at characteristics of ibadur rahman but this is kind of refer, returning back to the original format walladina and the ibadur rahman they are those who the translator writes they are the servants of the lord of mercy are those who do not give false testimony and who when they see some frivolity pass by with dignity all right i understand frivolity is an interesting um translation but nevertheless that's what the translator writes i actually was reading another translation um and so a little bit of an older translation but i don't know i found it very fascinating all right uh it's actually like a foreign translation it's not done by somebody english is their native language but i so typically with translations like that there's sometimes usage of maybe not common vocabulary but um i found it still very appropriate uh he says and when they pass by absurd things and i thought that was also very fascinating right <laughs> absurdity i thought that was very appropriate all right like a group of people gathered together in a park at midnight playing pokemon go right <laughs> absurd <laughs> that's that's just my mental image all right anyways getting back to this all right so the servants of the lord of mercy are those who do not give false testimony and who when they see some frivolity pass by with dignity so walladhina la yashhaduna zura so there's two things mentioned here number one is walladhina la yashhaduna zur number one they are people now the whole challenge is how to translate yashhaduna zur shahadatu zur all right there are two translations for this two interpretations for this number one and you kind of saw both translations that's why i shared that with you the first one uh, well the you know there are two ways to translate this some translate as they are those who do not give false testimony some translate they, those who do, who will not witness vanity all right who don't partake in who do not participate in you know vanity or or use or or something that is bad they do not partake they do not witness they do not attend to something that is bad so before we talk about this just let's break down these two words the word yash yashhaduna comes from shahida yashhadu shahada which actually in its origins means hadar hadira or hadara which means to be present to be present all right now from this one meaning that is taken is to present yourself somewhere to show up somewhere is basically hudur you showed up somewhere which also can be called shahada but also when a witness is called to court when a witness is called to court to testify that person has to show up and you know um go and and basically sit on the stand and give their testimony they have to present themselves that's why a witness is called a shahid they have to present themselves in court all right so that's why a witness is called shahid they have to come to court they have to show up in court so that's the meaning of shahida yashhaduna azur the word azur in the arabic language al kidhb wal batil that basically the root of the word is actually very interesting it refers to kind of folding your chest folding your chest which is basically kind of like folding you know kind of like curl um like um almost like curling into a ball curling into a ball and the imagery is very powerful because when you have nothing to hide the arabs the imagery there was when you have nothing to hide you stand up you know you sit up straight you face in in our culture a lot of times when somebody won't make eye contact with you we kind of take that as if like somebody has something to hide you tell them look me in the eyes and tell me 
And if somebody's got nothing to hide, they look you in the face and they tell you. Exactly. But if somebody's being kind of dodgy, all right, they're being shady, right? They're averting their eyes and they're looking right and left and they won't look at you directly. Then you're like, something's kind of fishy here, something suspicious. It's suspicious behavior. So the imagery of the Arabs was if you have nothing to hide, you stand forth. Like it was almost like to say, like, my heart is open, like I'm, I'm being transparent with you. I'll, I'll, if I could, I would open my chest and show you my heart. I'm speaking the truth. Right? The Arabs were very dramatic. <laughs> right? And, but if somebody had something to hide, they were lying, falsifying information. So it's like they would almost like cover up their chest. يَثْنُونَ سُدُورَهُمْ right? They would cover up their chest. They would kind of like look away from you and talk, speak to you indirectly. So that, as to say like, don't look into my heart. Right? Because that person's lying to you. So from that, eventually the word zur evolved into the meaning of lying. Falsifying information. Now, the word zur refers to something bad, al batil, something bad. So basically, what can zur refer to? There's lots of different opinions, um, and I'm, I want to share some of these opinions with you. But I want you to kind of stay with me here. Some have said that it refers to shirk. Some said it refers to worship of the idols. Some said that it's a gathering in which people are lying or slandering someone, um, like they're they're making up stuff about people. They're saying bad things about people. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that it means Allah wal ghina. It's like just wasting time. All right, just engaging in like singing and dancing and just wasting time. Um, some, many of the tabi'un, Abu al-Aliya, Ta'us, Muhammad ibn Sirin, Dahak, Rabi ibn Anas and many others said he ayad al-mushrikeen. They are the celebrations of the idols. Like when, because before Islam, the celebrations that they used to have for the idols, that some of the people who culturally continued to engage in the celebration of the idols, they referred to that. Amr ibn Qais said, a majalis susu. That it is basically to sit in gatherings where people are engaging, indulging in some type of sin. Malik, Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala narrates from his teacher, Az-Zuhri, that shurb al khamar that it is basically going to a gathering where people are consuming intoxicants. All right? And so on and so forth. Lots of different, um, you know, interpretations of what this gathering of Zur, what this Zur could be referring to. The thing I want to emphasize here, after giving you all of that, a lot of times people will take some of one or some of these interpretations and almost kind of quote them as if that is exactly what it refers to. Then how is it that all these remarkable, notable people from the same generation have different ideas about what Zur refers to? What they're basically doing is that the word Zur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses language very precisely and specifically in the Qur'an. The word Zur refers to something bad, something bad, something sinful. But Allah was not specific. These, mufassir, these people, these individuals, these scholars that I quoted, they're not doing anything wrong by giving this interpretation. They were basically talking about maybe what was prevalent in their society. What the problem in their community, their society was. That maybe they saw that people were kind of getting together and drinking. And so that's why he said, يَشْهَدُونَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ زُورِ Meaning that they don't go to gatherings where people sit and get intoxicated. They don't go get drunk at these parties. Maybe that's because that was a problem that they were dealing with in their society, in their community. Generally speaking, the Mufassirun, after quoting all these different positions and opinions and interpretations, they basically say that the, 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 the lesson to take from here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that evil might manifest in many different forms and ways within a society, in the social setting. Whatever the manifestation of that evil or society may be, these people stay away from that scene. Basically, to put it into general terms, these are people who stay away from, bad, from a bad scene, from a bad situation, where there's nothing but trouble. They just stay away from there. They steer clear from there. Let me just completely stay away from this situation. Because it's just asking for trouble. The second interpretation of Yashadun Azur is a very specific interpretation. And that is Shahadatu Zur 
what's called, and that is to give false testimony in court. That these are people who do not lie under oath. What it's basically talking about is a compromising of one's principles and morals and values to the point where your testimony, your word can be bought. That my friend, right, maybe a good friend of mine, my friend is, you know, in trouble with the law for having done something. Now, I want to get my buddy off the hook. So, even though I know that my friend did such and such, I show up to court and provide a false alibi. No, he wasn't even there. He was with me. And we were over here. And I'm lying through my teeth. But I'm doing it because, again, my, my, my ethics in this scenario are compromised because of my personal feelings towards someone. Or maybe somebody's bribing me to give some false testimony in court. That that's what it refers to. Do not lie under oath. Do not sell out. Whether that be for your, due to your personal feelings about someone, or it be for some type of material worldly gain, or holding a favor over somebody, or whatever the case may be. Never sell out. Stand for truth and justice. And this is also supported by uh, the very famous hadith of the Prophet wasallam that is authentically narrated in the books of Bukhari and Muslim that the Prophet wasallam he said, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates that the Prophet said, Ala unabbi'ukum bi akbar al-kaba'ir, shall I not tell you? Meaning, do you want me to tell you about the most, you know, egregious of the major sins? The most serious of sins? Thalafan. And he repeated this three times. Qulna bala ya Rasulullah. We said, of course, O Messenger of God, please inform us. Qala ashirku billah. Number one, associating partners with God. Number two, wa uququl walidain. Aq. Right? Wa uququl walidain. To disrespect. To disrespect and to, to disgrace. To dishonor your parents. Wa kana muttaki'an. The Prophet ﷺ was reclining. He was resting against something. Fajalas. And then he sat up. Which means that he sat up and moved away from whatever it is that he, he was kind of reclining against a wall. Or maybe itzika also refers to a pillow. So maybe he kind of had a pillow there. So he was kind of like reclining back on a pillow. He said, Ashirku billah. Wa uququl walidain. So it's leaving partners with God. You know, being disrespectful to your parents. Fajalasa, he sat up and he said, Allah wa qawla zur. Allah wa shahada ta zur. Allah wa qawla zur. Allah wa shahada ta zur. Allah wa qawla zur. Allah wa shahada ta zur. Then he kept repeating this phrase false testimony. Be careful of false testimony. Be very careful about selling out. Because the first two things, shirk billah is so heinous that it's really hard. For a believer to get to that particular point. Like disrespecting and like really breaking relations with your parents that severely is also something that is so inhumane. That it's really difficult to get to that particular point. But selling out? Well, but he's my friend. Oh, but she's my sister. But I need this money. But I need that job. I need this favor. That happens so quickly. We don't even realize. And it can sometimes happen without you even thinking that it's a problem. You'll sit there and you'll justify it to yourself. You know, everybody makes a mistake. It's to give him another opportunity, you know. We should have forgiveness. We should have mercy. What? Forgiveness, mercy. That's not your decision to make here. You have to speak the truth. You're under oath. And so the Prophet ﷺ, and the Sahaba say, فَمَا زَالَ يُكَرِّرُهَا He kept repeating this again and again, أَلَا وَقَوْلَ زُورُ أَلَا وَشَهَادَةَ زُورُ He kept repeating this over and over again, حَتَّى قُلْنَا لَيْتَهُ سَكَتْ That we wanted him to stop. Because every single time he said it, it shook. It shook our hearts. It was so terrifying and scary. 
that we wanted him to stop, that we, we understand we won't do it, we won't do it. Right, so this is the second meaning of it. So number one is that they do not attend bad evil gatherings or they do not give false testimony. The second part of the ayah, وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّهْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا The word Allahu, and when they pass by Allahu, they pass by in a dignified fashion. They pass by with dignity. Okay, now what does the word Allahu mean? Some have tried to suggest that the word Allahu basically means, um, you know, Allahu refers to just something that is not the best use of your time. Something that's maybe not a very productive activity. That sounds great, but it's actually incorrect. Imam al-Razi says that's, that's, that's not a correct interpretation. That, what, that to translate Allahu, to understand Allahu as an activity that is permissible, an activity that is permissible, but maybe isn't the most productive thing to do, that that's what it's talking about? No, that's not right. Why? Because Allah, what does Allah say in the Quran? وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّهُوِ مُعْرِدُونَ They are those people who abstain from Allah. Believers are people who abstain from Allah. And if we try to suggest, somebody may, might be like, well, brother, shouldn't we be productive and you know, you utilize our time in a better fashion? That's a separate topic. Sure, that's fantastic. That's great. And that's a very needed topic in our times. Right? Pokemon Go, right? So that's a, that's a very needed topic in our particular times. However, the re, we have to be very careful. Remember, I've spoken about this previously, that we cannot become overzealous, we cannot engage in the tafsir of the Qur'an, the interpretation of the Qur'an, by being overzealous and just kind of like dumping our own ideas into it. I feel, I don't care how you feel. It is what it is and it says what it says. How you feel is irrelevant. I'm very happy that you have riven, risen to this amazing level of productivity, right? That you are now more productivity than human, right? But it, it doesn't matter, right? That's, that's very good for you, I'm happy for you. But you don't get to interpret the Qur'an because you feel a certain way. This is, this is God's book. The Prophet ﷺ came to teach us uh, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And today it might sound great, later on these are the types of things that lead to extremism, ghulu. Because today you're going to say, oh stay away from that because it's not productive. And if you validate that rhetoric too much and you start talking about it as if that is the law, tomorrow somebody will come along and will actually say it is the law. And that's how extremism occurs. Iyakum al ghulu fid deen. The Prophet said, don't become extreme. Be very careful, because it will happen very quickly. You'll become extreme in your approach to the religion. And Imam Razi rahimullah ta'ala says, Allah sahu anna lahwa kullama yajibu and yulha wa yutrak. Even linguistically, the word lahu means something that you should discard. Something that should be left and abandoned. Wa minhum man fassara lahwa bi kulli ma laysa bi ta'atin. Some people said, oh lahu is anything that is not an act of worship. If you're not worshipping, you're in lahu. So if you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs, lahu. Right? If you're sitting there on your phone, lahu. Right? But he says, wa huwa da'ifun. He says that is a very weak op opinion and position. لِأَنَّ الْمُبَاحَاتَ لَا تُعَدُّ لَغْوًا You do not make the rules, I do not make the rules, God makes the rules. And anything that Allah has made permissible, nobody has the right to make it impermissible. In fact, one of the errors of the nation's past was, they used to come along and in their overzealousness, they used to make permissible things impermissible. And Allah cursed them because of this. They made the religion extreme. So no, something that God has made permissible can never be deemed impermissible. Don't do that. And so what's meant by lahu here is bad, sin. Lahu here refers to sin. Okay, so it's saying when they pass by sin, like the first one was about indulging. Believers, the Ibadur Rahman, the slaves of the Most Merciful, they are the people who do not indulge in sin, engage in a sinful activity. Now this is talking about if they happen to pass by it, if they just happen to pass by it, marru kiraman, they pass by with dignity. 
They pass by with dignity. What does it mean to pass by with dignity? Pass by in a dignified fashion. Number one, they pass by without indulging in it, without engaging in it, without partaking in it, number one. But the bigger meaning of not uh, passing by with dignity, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is really all we need. That Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he passed by some people who were engaging in some type of sinful activity. Some narrations mentioned that they were sitting there and they were gambling. People were sitting and they were gambling. And he passed by these people gambling. But what he did was, as he came up upon that gathering where they were gambling, he just kind of looked the other way and just quietly walked away. Because they were, maybe they were drunk, they were intoxicated, they were, or, or you know, they, they, whatever the case was, they were engaging in some activity. He just looked the other way and he walked away. The, the Prophet ﷺ, when he found out about how Ibn Mas'ud handled the situation by just kind of like going in the other direction, fight, leaving, leaving this fight for another day, or maybe noting maybe who was there, even in the case, you know, people always, again, get very emotional about, well, don't you have to forbid the evil though? Are you trying to say Ibn Mas'ud did not forbid the evil? No, 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 he did. But is forbidding the evil throwing a hissy fit? Is that forbidding the evil? Is forbidding the evil starting to like yell and scream and start to push and shove people? To berate people, to belittle people? To get into a confrontation with people? Is that the only way to forbid evil? But what he did was maybe he realized, okay, such and such is here. I'll talk to him later. Right now he's going to start fighting, he's going to get defensive. I'll talk to him later inshallah. Because the goal is what? To help this person leave this bad activity. Not to win an argument. So he just walked the other way. The Prophet ﷺ when he found out, he said, لَقَدْ أَصْبَحَ Ibn Mas'ud wa amsa kariman." This morning you were just Ibn Mas'ud. This evening you are Karim. You are a noble man. This morning you were just Ibn Mas'ud. This evening you are a noble individual. You have understood dignity and nobility. Alright? So a part of the meaning of when they pass by sin, they pass by in a dignified fashion, they don't look down on the people. They don't think they're better than the people. They don't just get into people's faces and confront them and just say, I, I have to do my part. That's spiritual OCD. I, I just have to say, no, no, no. You need help. You need more help than they do. They're just, they messed up, they engage in a bad activity. You actually think you're better than people. You think that the whole world revolves around you. So they move about their way in a dignified fashion. And they, they actually put some thought into how to correct this problem, rather than just having to get something off their chest. وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا With that, inshaAllah, we'll go ahead and conclude today's uh, lesson. Uh, real quickly, inshaAllah, before we end, um, first of all, I wanted to apologize for going over time. And uh, secondly, I've been meaning to request everyone, uh, but I keep um, you know, forgetting at the end of class, um, you know, alhamdulillah, one of our uh, students at Quran Intensive, uh, Sister Munira, uh, her mother is very ill. And, um, you know, she's a long way from home, a long way from her mother. Uh, so please make dua that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give her shifa kamila ajila. That may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give her a complete and quick shifa. La yugadiru saqman. Such a shifa that the, no illness remains afterwards. Amin ya rabbal alameen. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanakallah, bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nasafir wa natuwilaik.